So what have we learned over time about uh, resilience from many different kinds of studies? There's been all kinds of different work all over the world and many different ways of thinking about resilience, but there are some striking consistencies in what we've learned. And I've called um, the most widely implicated protective factors the short list. And these, these are the ones, these are the protective factors that come up over and over again in many different studies, many different situations. They come up in war, they come up in studies of child maltreatment. These are associated with resilience under very adverse circumstances. And you notice I've given examples here of different levels. From, you know, it's a different level to have capable caregiving, effective schools, and good self-regulation skills. So what does this short list mean? I have argued that it means that in many different situations, there are some profound and imp profoundly imp important fundamental protective systems that protect human development and promote good outcomes under challenging situations. And these have evolved through cultural and biological evolution over the millennia of human life. And they've been shaped by cultural learning as well as biological natural selection. And these are the adaptive systems that promote human function and develop, development. A good caregiving and family attachment system is profoundly important, as you all know, for not only promoting healthy development in general, but for promoting resilience in high-risk situations. Can we promote resilience? I would argue yes, and I think we have a growing body of work saying, you know, indicating that we can promote resilience. And I've described in various writings a framework to think about uh, promoting resilience. And, the, you know, the whole research of resilience, the impact in the intervention field has been transformative. In the olden days, a lot of times intervention was thought about from a medical model or a, you know, addressing risk and so forth, or let's fix this child, let's give them some medicine or whatever. And I think what happened with the resilience framework is that people began to look at a positive framework for intervention. How can we define our mission in positive ways, frame positive goals, promote positive development? Can we include positive influences? There's more to life than risk, people realized. We need to measure positive influences and outcomes. You're not going to see the positive outcomes if you don't even measure them, uh, people realized. And there are some strategies that the resilience literature points to, I'll come back to in a moment. And then we have a framework that if you take systems seriously, you have to think about multiple levels of function, and where, where do we have the most leverage to intervene? These are the three strategies for positive change. Um, you can focus on risk. You can try to reduce risk factors. You can try to reduce the exposure of children to adversity or reduce, you know, like homelessness isn't good for children. It would be good if we could prevent that. We've been very successful in the U.S. preventing premature birth, although we could do a much better job. We're not as high as we should be for the level of wealth in this country. It's way easier to prevent premature birth than to deal with a premature baby. We also can focus on assets, making resources available, whether it's a tutor or a school or all kinds of resources, healthier food. We can provide books. There are lots of resources you can provide to boost better functioning in children. But if you really want to mobilize the most powerful engines for change, you want to mobilize those big protective systems, the ones I call ordinary magic. You want to either restore or harness the most powerful adaptive systems for human development. And you can think of adoption as an effort to intervene in the most powerful system for human development, which is family, attachment, caregiving, and so 